and this is not from frostbite either. I, I lived in Iran when I was a little boy and got bit by a fly and then I, when I was reasonably grown up I got my hand in a table saw. So, so I got scars that look like frostbite that have nothing to do with the cold. Um, a great aspect of the race of course is the, is the atmosphere. You know, just imagine sitting down and drinking a cup of coffee while racing watching the northern lights, a light display that is almost personal uh, disco show for you while the race is going on. Giving interviews to some, you know, to Donna Navarona who has won Olympic medals, sitting in Shaq Tulik while you're, while every second counts. You gotta rest the dogs, mind you. You gotta, you gotta divide your time so that the, that the dogs do the absolute best and hopefully the tank is not empty before you get to the finish line, but every, everything you do counts and there's so many aspects from trail to spectators to pilots to officials to checkers to your competitors to the media to the great part of the, of the beauty of the land and that of course is a huge part for, for, of my love is, is the, the beauty of Alaska. It's, we're tra training or run, running on some indigenous trails that that have been there for a long, long time, and we have the, the honor to travel over it. So that's, that's pretty neat. And again, Alaska sometimes is warm, you know. We all took a bath here. <coughs> in the very center, just before the dogs are going to jump in the water here, um, there's a little patch of white. The bridge is actually to the left of the dogs, and the dogs are going to avoid that bridge because it's brown. It looks like the water. It's a bunch of logs with a bunch of spruce boughs over it. To their right, they see the patch of snow, and they think that's the trail. So they're going to run right to that white patch, and then the leaders are going to fall into the water, and the swing dogs are going to jump right after them. And we all did that. We all did the same exact thing. Uh, about half the team was in the water swimming, and then they got on the bridge, and they said, oh, oh you know. And scrambled on the bridge, and fortunately, by the time the the sled got <laughs> near, we were already back onto the main trail. And the camera, of course, the, whenever you see a camera, you got to be really suspicious. You know, something's about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys, of course, have turned around. They were there. Some of the media's, or they might have even landed with a helicopter. You know, the more the more cameras you see, the more like oh. Something's about to happen. And, and it, it screws up the dog sometimes. You know, they might look up and they might lose concentration because they see a gaggle of, of photographers and they lose concentration. And, and then, you know, something, something bad happens. So, just, yes? If, if the dogs go in the water uh, and they really get wet, are you better off to just keep running and yeah. let them work that, yeah. that wetness? Out? Absolutely. They got the spin and dry cycle. We let them run. We let them roll around in the snow. Sometimes it depends. It depends, you know. There's no. What I've learned over the years is, of course, there's no patent answer for every situation. But mostly, they just roll in the snow for a little bit, shake it off, and keep on going. I guarantee you, at 50 below, when you jump in the water, nothing comes out. I've seen dogs. I've gotten into 45 below water which sounds crazy. How can it be 45 below and there's lots of water around? The Copper Basin is usually a wet race and we have to, used to have to go through a lot of water. One year I, I came into a, a checkpoint and, and that's a road, a road race, meaning the, your, your truck can go to the checkpoints. And I got into the checkpoint and I just threw my dogs in the truck. And I said, you know, if you want to disqualify me, go right ahead. But my dogs were literally icing up. And I said to the officials, you better let everybody put their dogs in their truck because damage is going to be done. It was 45 below. And no matter how much they were shaking, <coughs> trying to shake the, their hair, the, the moisture up, it was just, I mean, they were like icicles. So I let them rest six or eight hours. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. Let them rest in my truck. And when they came out, they were all cozy and fine. And we kept on going. You know, everybody, it set the precedent and everybody was allowed to do that. On Iditarod, of course, we can't do that. We can't, we got to, you know, yeah. sometimes you make a big fire. You do all this kind of stuff. You ring out your equipment and put the dogs in a huddle. And the best, of course, is not to go into those situations. Calvin and Blondie, 
Riptide, Sister, Ingot, Poitras, all kinds of good dogs. The booties are worn mostly for protection. Nowadays we booty the entire team uh, because it's more efficient to protect every foot than to only deal with feet that might crack or might already have a problem. Uh, key to that, of course, is to have your dogs have their feet messed with from birth. Day one, I stick puppies in my... It looks like I have three in there right now. <laughs> I stick puppies in my shirt and I walk around the kennel with them. I carry them around wherever I go and I, when I pull them out instinctively, I rub, rub their feet. Because sooner or later, the vets will check their feet on a regular basis. I will check their feet on a constant basis. And my dogs are just as ticklish as your dogs are on their feet. My dogs let you spread their toes apart, let you look at the connective tissue, let you roll over their feet. And most of yours probably don't. Because you didn't make a big deal about it from birth. You know, I hold my puppies by their feet and rub them all the time because of this. Because they're going to wear booties. Same with the dew claws. The dew claws come off about, you know, 24 to 36 hours after they're born, mostly because there's going to be a secondary problem. If you have dew claws, the rubs from the booties is worse than some of the foot problems initially. So if you have dogs with dew claws, I have all kinds of little tricks how to not make it a big issue. Yes? How many dogs on a typical race will you drop? On, in, I However, as many as I need. I'm, I drop you at the blink of an eye. I'm the worst. We're allowed 16 dogs at the start. We have to start with a minimum of 12. We have to finish with a minimum of 6. If a dog just hacks, coughs, doesn't finish his or her meal, I drop them. If you, if you look at statistics on the Adiderat, I will have the fewest dogs earliest of anybody. And I often have the most dogs at the finish. My, my drop rate is, is usually, you know, I, I pride myself of not, know, not only seeing what's happening. It's real easy if you're real experienced. It's real easy to see what's going on. <coughs> what's real difficult is to see what's about to go on. The anticipation, the, the insight. If your dog is, you know, Celine has one ear up and one ear down. If two ears are one and a half ears down, something's not right. I know that dog's not going to make it to the finish line. I'd probably keep her for one more checkpoint. She might have had a bad day. If she doesn't totally recover, if she doesn't look 100%, I send her home. If you drop a dog, you're never wrong because you did the right thing by the dog. Can you drop a dog temporarily? No, you can't. You can never get them back in the team. So Even once, if you carry them for Well, a while? I carry them all the time. I give them rides. We, call, we don't <laughs> drop them then. We, okay. we just That's give them rides. That's not official drop. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Once they're signed out, they get flown off the trail. And that's the first time they're allowed to receive medicine. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why we would leave dogs behind. They might need an anti-inflammatory or, or some medication. We're not allowed to give them any oral medication while they're on the race, of course. They have to perform totally on their own merits, and we, we're not allowed to use any drugs on them. So, so sometimes, I, I mean, usually I, I have the dogs receive Rimadil as soon as I drop them, give them over to a vet, and then I joke, can I have them back now? You know? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work that way, of course. You, uh, and I keep stressing that to all the people I coach. You're never wrong if you drop the dog. They, I, I remember reading about this this year, but I can't remember do, drug testing for the dogs. Drug During testing or just before and after? No, drug testing is ongoing. Drug testing, the P team, as we lovingly call them, they're ongoing, and you never know when you're encountering them. They typically take a little Ziploc bag with a little bungee uh, elastic and two alligator clips, zip it on the dog, and we bring them over to a neighboring sled and you get a sample. <laughs> if they don't get urine, you could, they could draw blood. And it's a random generated list of, we're going to get you in Unilaplete, and we never know where. We know the top 20 teams will be tested at the, at the finish. And um, in between, we could, of course, we never know. This year, I didn't see any. I think I got tested at the end, but I didn't. My schedule happened to be, or, or my number was not up anywhere um, until the... Two, well, that would finish. obviously keep people from slipping Rimadil when they're out of the checkpoint. Absolutely. Well, no, that's... The, 